Now that we've looked at the bonding that happens in particular molecules, we can draw these Lewis structures and we can also kind of go one step further for that and look at what the molecular geometry of these molecules is going to look like in three dimensions. So if we have a generic Lewis structure, which is A, X, N, here A is going to be our central atom, and X is going to be something we call a ligand. And a ligand is any atom or ion bonded to the central atom. And in the formulas we'll look at in this class, n can range anywhere from 1, where we have a linear molecule, all the way up to 6, where we have an octahedral molecule. And it can be any number in between. So we'll, we've looked at a lot of complexes that we would call AX, or these diatomics. But in reality, there are many different molecular geometries that can exist for molecules. So when drawing molecular or when drawing molecules, we can come up with a set of rules or a set of guidelines. So number one is we want to first identify the central atom. And this is very, very important because we need to identify or we need to be able to see how this central atom is going to achieve its octet. It's going to achieve that octet in any way that it can. So when we're looking at this particular octet, we need to figure out how many electrons it's going to need to achieve that. Okay, The key giveaways Number one, it appears only once in a formula. If you have a particular molecule like CH4, carbon only occurs once, hydrogen four times. Carbon is going to be the central atom. Another thing to consider, if the molecule has hydrogen and oxygen and one other element, the third element is the central atom. Third thing to look at for carbon containing compounds, carbon is the central atom. And some of these carbon containing compounds are going to be these long extended molecules. And we'll have to look at them a little bit differently. But for most carbon-containing compounds, carbon is going to be the central atom. Lastly, if you can't identify the central atom from these four steps, the central atom is the least electronegative. And this is typically because it has to share its electrons with more than one species. So if you have a highly electronegative atom, it's not going to want to share its electrons as much, so it's going to be a ligand rather than a central atom. Once we've identified the central atom, our next step is to determine the number of valence 
electrons on the central atom. And you should be able to do this very, very quickly without much time. And a valence electron is going to be considered to be the number of electrons in the outermost shell. The exception to this is a completely filled d orbital as well as a completely filled f orbital. Okay, so if you have a completely filled d or f orbital, these are not considered valence. So for example, let's look at a zinc atom and let's determine how many valence electrons it has. Zinc is going to have an argon noble gas core and its electron configuration is going to be 4s2, 3d10. Remember that a completely filled d subshell does not contribute to the number of valence electrons. So this zinc atom is going to have two valence electrons. Another example we can look at is bromine. It's also going to have the argon noble gas core and its electron configuration is 4s2, 3d10, 4p5. And it has seven valence electrons. If we look at a nitrogen atom, it has a helium noble gas core. Its electron configuration is 2s2, 2p3, and it will have five valence electrons. So now that we've determined what the central atom is and how many valence electrons that central atom has, what we next need to determine is how many electrons that central atom needs to fill its noble gas electron configuration. Okay, so step number three is going to be to determine the number of electrons each ligand contributes to the central atom. And this is going to be vital in figuring out how many ligands we need to reach a noble gas core. So for example, if we have a halogen, that halogen such as chlorine, fluorine, bromine, or iodine is going to have a total of seven valence electrons. We saw how HCl formed. When that HCl forms, a covalent bond forms between this electron right here and another electron on the central atom. So for a halogen, it will contribute one electron to the central atom. If we also have a hydroxide, which is an OH group, in an OH group, it's going to behave very, very similarly to a halogen when it forms a bond because that OH group is going to form a single bond with the central atom and this will also contribute one electron to that central atom. A hydrogen is a fairly obvious example. It only has one electron so it's going to contribute that one electron when it forms a covalent bond with our central atom. 
If we looked at something like oxygen or anything in the oxygen group, such as sulfur, oxygen has six valence electrons. It is very, very electronegative. So when it forms a bond, it needs both of the electrons from the central atom. So when oxygen forms a bond, both electrons come from the central atom. So we can say that in terms of the bonding contribution, oxygen is going to contribute zero electrons to that central atom.